This is CBC Here and Now. It's, it's devastating. It's tragedy. It's and, and not just one. I mean, one incident in a town like Burgio is, is huge. And then when you have two. Grieving in Burgio tonight, one man dead after an accident at the arena. Another loses his house in a devastating fire. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. We start tonight with terrible incidents in Burgio. People in that town are mourning after two separate tragic incidents just five days before Christmas. One man is dead after an accident at the arena involving a Zamboni. Occupational health and safety has been called in to investigate along with the police. The man was pronounced dead last night. He was discovered under an ice resurfacing machine that had tipped onto its side, and it happened outside the Burgio Storm Stadium. It's unclear how the man ended up under the machine. Burgio Lapoil MHA Andrew Parsons was in the district yesterday. I was an individual, uh, you know, well known in the community, uh, worked at the rink, and I, I don't know the details, so I don't want to speculate. I've seen some pictures uh, of you know, the, the aftermath, but I, it's, it's horrific. I, I mean, you're so close. I mean, no time of year is a good time. And then when it's just before Christmas, uh, I, I think it's gotta be even harder on the family. It's, I can't imagine what they're feeling. Another tragic event in Burgio last night, a fire broke out and destroyed this home. The fire started just after the town received a brand new fire truck. Pictures of the aftermath show that the house is destroyed. And, uh, when you wake up this morning, you see the smoke and you see the trucks and uh, and pe some some people have lost a home. And, uh, you know, there was absolute devastation, as you could see. And I, I don't think there's anything that could be gathered from it. Uh, but if there's a silver lining is that thankfully there's no one hurt. And uh, that's the only positive I can take out of it. Besides uh, being lucky enough to have such a great fire department to react so quickly. We'll have more on this sad story in Burgio ahead in about 30 minutes on Here and Now. Well, there was another house fire last night, same part of the island too. This one in Port of Basque. The Red Cross says one man received minor burns as he rescued his three young children from their burning home. The children are aged two, four and five. The Red Cross is helping the family with emergency supplies such as clothing and food and relatives have given them a temporary place to stay. Well, to politics now, the Premier maintains he had nothing to do with the controversial hiring of Carla Foote at the rooms, but as leader, he'll take responsibility for it. Foote, a longtime Liberal staffer, scored a six-figure salary without having to do an interview and without any competition. Christopher Mitchellmore, the former Minister of Tourism and Culture, he has taken the blame for how the Lieutenant Governor's daughter scored the job. He has apologized to the House and to the rooms, and he was suspended without pay for two weeks. If you go back in history, you would find many, many ministers would have used the same kind of hiring processes yeah. that would have been used in this particular case, and the recommendations of the reprimand would have been that? the same. Just because other people have done it doesn't make it right. No, and that's my point here. Uh, that is not right, and that is the reason why I accept the responsibility to fix this. Just like I fixed many other problems in this province, I did it with the Independent Appointments Commission. We're doing it with Muskrat Files. I'm going to fix this. I take the responsibility from this report as Premier to fix what happened here. We had to find a way to appropriately move people around government. Now, I sat down with the Premier late yesterday, and we're going to air that year-end interview in two parts on Here and Now on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Now, we covered a lot of ground beyond the Carla Foote Mitchellmore controversy. We spoke about the state of the province's finances, immigration challenges, and our shrinking population. And despite many difficulties, the Premier says his government has made a lot of headway. Three years ago, people were saying that we couldn't build infrastructure in this province. Go into Cornwall today when the Tories announced that never delivered it. The hospital is moving forward. The long-term care site will be open in February. Go into Gander, go into Grand Falls, Windsor, go into Springdale. Their institutions and healthcare infrastructure is being upgraded. The Waterford, the replacement for the Waterford Hospital will happen. That is coming along. The schools, there's schools being built. The trans labrador Highway, when people said we couldn't pave that, is being paved. The mining industry in Lab West, is coming back together. There's a lot of good things happening in this province. We put in place a plan. I faced a lot of challenges and we're delivering for New Flanders and Labradorians. Good morning and Merry Christmas to everybody. 
Uh, we are from Mount Pearl Senior High, just down the road. When teachers bring teenagers and seniors together for a party, well, the day can only get a lot brighter. Our adopt a senior story is just ahead. Well, uh, that escalated quite quickly. We saw some snow move through. That's a, a live look outside the CBC video or CBC studio, rather. And uh, we did see that snow move in about an hour ago. It looks like, if we take a look at the satellite and radar, it does look like that band is actually <clears throat> moving quite quickly and moving south of the metro area as we speak. If we zoom out, we talked about yesterday how we're looking at about two to five centimeters of snow. That was the first round of another round getting started and that's going to move in as we head through the night tonight. That's going to bring another uh, round of snow, bringing accumulations up to about two to five centimeters, more than likely on the five centimeter range of that. And it's a quiet weekend for most of us, so we'll have all those details coming up. A man who stabbed another man in the neck with a box cutter is going to prison. The ruling came down in a Happy Valley Goose Bay courtroom this morning. Michael John Lid showed little reaction when he was sentenced to seven years for attempted murder. The 31 year old has more than 100 prior offenses on his record, including sexual assault and arson convictions. The stabbing last spring happened after Lid and the other man had had a sexual encounter in the victim's car outside a gas station. Two men charged after an attempted bank machine theft in St. John's last January have been found not guilty. Corey Quilty and Jamie Kennedy were both in court to hear the decision this morning. They were accused of break and entry as well as theft after a front end loader smashed through the bank on uh, on Newfoundland Drive to take an ATM. Judge Colin Flynn said the evidence against them was circumstantial and he said they probably did it but he couldn't conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that they had actually done it. Kennedy's lawyer said there's a big difference between certainty and probability. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt requires proof approaching certainty. So you'll frequently see stated in cases that probability is insufficient to found the stigma of a criminal conviction. Uh, the proof has to be so solid that it approaches certainty. The stuffing of hampers continues as we wind down the final few days before Christmas. Many organizations are packing up boxes of food and getting ready to deliver them to the people who need them. One such place was here at St. Andrew's Church, known locally as the Kirk. Or even the big guys showed up, as you see there, to help the Rotary Club of St. John's with its 90-year-old tradition. Rotarians and other groups filled more than 350 hampers, all of them destined for people who need some help, especially at this time of year. It really uh, hits at home, you know, how important it is to, to give back to the community and do charity work wherever you can. Uh, today we're assembling the hampers. Tomorrow we're going to give those out. And uh, just to have that connection with the people of the community is just a terrific thing. It uh, really warms my heart for Christmas. Well, a group of high school students in Mount Pearl did their part to make Christmas a little bit brighter for some seniors in their community. The objective of today's lesson plan was to create some charitable memories. And Cease Hare tagged along. Instilling the spirit of generosity and kindness isn't taught inside the classroom. Today it's being taught away from the smart boards. They came to Hillcrest Estate Retirement Home bearing gifts. These students from Mount Pearl Senior High have been on a mission for months, raising money for presents for seniors. And that wasn't all. They even brought along entertainment to the party. Band members or music students at the school. Through various fundraisers inside the school, a Halloween bake sale and various ticket sales, the students managed to raise almost $1,000. Money for presents for Christmas morning. Names will be drawn to see who gets them. These have done like a lot for us in the past and like we just want to give them back, give stuff back to them. And what's a party without treats? A few chocolates and Christmas cards. It restores your faith in humanity. 
you know, these kids, uh, and we've seen it a lot over Christmas, uh, our residents respond so well to youth, to young children. We've seen so many acts of kindness from children and youth throughout the Christmas season. The seniors' appreciation of this gesture is evident, and visits from the younger ones this time of year brings back memories of their own childhoods. I used to do them myself when I was a little girl. I loved dancing and I still do that. Mm -hmm. And we have concerts and only how they would get would be Christmas and Easter. So we enjoyed that. Teachers at the school say 30 students put the whole project together on their own. They started a few months ago, ran with it and did the work. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the town of Bishop's Falls is welcoming Christmas in style with gazillions of lights, and they've just flipped on those lights on their boardwalk. Here now is Garrett Barry is there this evening, and with any luck, we'll see those lights in a short bit. So, Garrett, what, what are we seeing there? Well, exactly what we're trying to see here is about maybe half a kilometer of lights. I did some quick math today. There's 80 different strands, 50 different light bulbs on each. That's a total of 4,000 lights here on the boardwalk. This is the very first Christmas at the boardwalk event. Uh, here in Bishop's Falls, you've got plenty of Christmas decorations, actually some a nativity scene near me and some gifts in the background. Uh, the display is very impressive. I'm going to try to see if I can get you a look at exactly what we're looking at here. Uh, I can tell you also that there was a lot of work that went into this scene. I got a chance to meet with some of the volunteers who did just all of this work starting in November. We had a staff meeting and we just came up with the idea of Christmas on the boardwalk. We thought it was creative and then from there it just spurred into lights, lights and more lights and Christmas displays. So. Uh, we had to figure out the electrical. There was no power on this boardwalk, so we had to figure that out. Then we had to count the lights, and you know, it's not easy figuring out how many lights you need to cover off a stretch of boardwalk. So we did that, and we broke it up in sections, and decided that we would change themes as you walk along it, so that you won't just see the same thing, you'll see different things as you go through the boardwalk. We uh, initially installed the boardwalk here on Riverside Drive. Uh, maybe about a year ago, I guess, and it's been really, really heavily populated. A lot of people have been using it a lot. So, um, yeah, we thought it was a great idea just to enhance uh, activity around the boardwalk this year uh, throughout uh, the winter months by, uh, by adding uh, some Christmas lights and stuff like that and really bringing a Christmas theme to it. Well, no, I'm no expert in hanging lights, but um, I probably will end up being one after this project's done. <laughs> Uh, part of part of the uh, the festivities here was Mr. and Mrs. Claus actually dropped by for the lighting ceremony. Of course, that's a big treat because we all know how busy they are at this time of year. But there were also some other special events. I'm standing here with the Little Carnival King and Little Car Carnival Queen, Liam and Madison. And it's a very exciting time of year, guys. So I wanted to ask you the question that's on everybody's mind. What are you hoping for for Christmas? Um, iPhone 11 Pro Max. And, uh, iPhone 11 Max. Is this the first time no, that you've Pro said... Pro Max. Oh, Pro Max. I apologize. Of course, you want to get that right. Yes. Is this the first time that you've asked for that? Yes. Yes. And so, uh, <laughs> this is a lot of pressure on Santa Claus that you're putting on him right now. <laughs> All right. And I know that there's another gift that's probably just as big. Madison, what are you asking Santa for this year when you had a chance to speak to him today? A newborn baby. A newborn baby you're asking for. Like a, like a little brother or sister? It's a, it's a girl. You want a little sister. And, and have you had a chance to say, a think about what this little sister should be named? Rosie. Rosie. And now, this is also a pretty big gift. Are, are you, if Santa brings you a newborn baby sister, are you going to promise to take care of her? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And why do you want a newborn baby sister? Because I like newborn babies. Because <laughs> you like it. Wow, that's a pretty good Is reason. Is it a toy? Uh, no, I think she's looking for a real baby sister, you know? not a toy. It's a little bit of a toy. Oh, a little bit of a toy. Very good. Well, as you can just, as you can see, guys, the uh, hopes are high going into the holiday season. The decorations are great, too. And uh, I understand, uh, actually, there was a little bit of hot chocolate that was uh, being served up around here. So I'm going to go see if I can uh, get a sip before uh, the end of the night. 
What warms your heart at Christmas time? My family and my friends. Seeing it all through their eyes is, is the most heartwarming for me. Christmas includes everybody and that's what's important. It's just, you know, everybody feels the, the warmth of the season. What'd you say? Thank you. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Busy time of year. If you haven't had a chance to make your donation, we've got 11 more days. We take donations right up until the uh, 31st. Mm -hmm. This is a good Christmassy look. Yeah, a little bit more casual What's than that? normal. Yeah, it uh, oh. jingle bells. Jingles. It jingles. <laughs> Very nice. Well, it's ugly Christmas sweater. That's not an ugly sweater, though. No, it's not ugly. Yeah. It's cute. I like it. Okay. God, you can only wear it for so many days, so it's I figured. Cute. It's cute sweater day. It might reappear at Christmas Eve. Well, okay. <laughs> Anyhow, as we get closer to Christmas, of course, everyone paying attention to weather. Boy, the looking outside looked pretty Christmassy. It uh, deteriorated quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Figured that would happen as the snow band moved in, uh, but this uh, warmer air has moved yeah, in. Yeah, it wasn't very cold. No, not at all, uh, especially a, a part for parts of the coast. Let's take a look at those temperatures. Uh, reaching the one degree mark along the northeast coast, uh, reached a high near minus three in St. John's, and those temperatures went back below zero up through Labrador, except around Cartwright. You, 
you uh, sat around one degree for most of the day today. Look at those warmer temperatures in Lab City. Minus five was your daytime high, so uh, quite nice. But here's a look at that snow band. Uh, right now moving south if we zoom in and moving south of St. John's as we speak. But again, that next area of snow will move in through the night tonight. You can see that uh, on the future tracker. But here's a look at what we're looking at as far as accumulations go. So still looking at about close to five centimeters of snow for most of us uh, as we head into the early morning hours. And with that, the rest of the island should actually uh, clear out overnight tonight once that snow moves through. So pretty quiet portions of Labrador, coastal Labrador will clear out as well as a ridge of high pressure moves in. So if you are planning on traveling on the Avalon over the next couple of hours, certainly take care because uh, those roads are deteriorating quite quickly with that snow. Uh, otherwise, those winds are going to ramp up as well. So 50 to 70 kilometer per hour winds are expected overnight tonight. So in some of those snow squalls or uh, rather bands of snow, we should see some uh, potential for some reduced visibilities. Overall temperatures should hover around one degree tonight. So temperatures are actually going to climb for the metro area as we head towards the west coast. You're looking at temperatures in the minus single digits for most of you. Uh, St. Anthony minus three and then similar temperatures up through Labrador. But those cooler temperatures are moving in from the west. So minus 14 for Lab City tonight, minus 10 in Happy Valley Goose Bay and a similar temperature for Nain. Now tomorrow, Another round of snow will at least flurries, we should say, for the northeast is expected. And then along the west coast as well, you could see a few flurries through the day. Otherwise, it should be quiet and actually going to see uh, some clearing skies or at least some sun peeking out at times up through Labrador. You're looking at the chance of uh, plenty of sunshine tomorrow, thanks to that big ridge of high pressure. And then uh, eventually we're going to see those temperatures <clears throat> through the day uh, will uh, actually fall into Sunday. So here's where we're standing as far as those uh, snow goes tomorrow along the northeast coast. Another about two to five centimeters of snow will fall. And then we could see this is including what's falling tonight upwards of about five to 10 for the northern Avalon Bonavista Peninsula as well. Uh, otherwise, hovering around the one degree mark, northerly winds about uh, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. And then Clarenville sitting around minus one. Those temperatures pretty much sitting there. Other around the south coast hovering around the zero degree mark. Looking at uh, some sunshine peeking out. Minus two for Corner Brook. And then uh, more sunshine as you head up towards Labrador. Slight chance of a few flurries for Cartwright. But overall temperatures sitting in the minus uh, 12 degree range for Churchill Falls. And Lab City sitting at about minus 11. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll look ahead coming up. And thanks for the special effects with the sweater because you've got green on there. So every now oh. and then it looked like you were magically snowing all over the place. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I forgot about the green screen. That's right. Special effects. There's the blue. Oh, there's some sun. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. A little bit of Christmas fun courtesy of Ms. Brawweiler. Well, winter solstice is tomorrow night and for people from Iran, it's a big celebration. It's called Yalda and this afternoon afternoon, here now is Carolyn Stokes met with some students from Memorial University's Iranian Students Association to find out some more about this ancient festival. Yalta night, you know, actually is the longest night of the year and um, it's just a couple of minutes or less than a minute, even longer than the other nights and uh, people in ancient Iran knew about this and uh, they didn't like darkness and they tried to overcome it. Yeah. And what sorts of things do you do during Yalda? Uh, we gather together with our families, especially the older ones. We go to our grandpa's or grandma's houses and we eat a lot of fruit, food, and especially uh, pomegranate and watermelon. These are like the symbols of Yalda night. And we usually try to wear bright colors and especially red. Red is like a significant color. <laughs> Why is red significant? What does it represent? Uh, um, maybe it's like the symbol of the love, affection. And yeah, and yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And maybe morning light? Yeah, that's, that's what I read uh, online. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I didn't know about that. <laughs> And why is Yalda so special? Why do you celebrate it? It is like a very uh, popular uh, cultural event now. 
and uh, it's like we are getting ready to the coldness of winter. We, we eat like um, summer fruits, for example, watermelon, and we laugh a lot and we gather together. Popular activities is like reading poetry, especially Hafez. Hafez is an old Persian uh, poet and we read Divana Hafez. And in our culture, it is like a um, fortune teller. And you know, it may sound strange, but uh, we make a wish and we open the book and we read some uh, verse of uh, his po poems. And uh, you know, somehow uh, he has the answers. You're away from home now, and so you won't be celebrating with your family? Um, unfortunately, no. Uh, no. That's w one of the reasons why we had the Yalda night event with my Iranian society, uh, because we are so uh, far away from home and on such a special night. Tomorrow night is the act actually Yalda night, and we will have a potluck and we get together again and try to you know overcome this darkness yeah. <laughs> because they, we believe that at the end of the dark the light will come true. Wonderful. Thank you so much and I hope you have a wonderful Yalda night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>The last of her kind, Catholic hymns in the Innu dialect will introduce you to a mother-daughter duo who want to preserve them. That's ahead.
Well, she's the last of her kind. 79-year-old Akat Piwash is an Innu woman from Natwashish, and she's the only one of her generation who still sings Catholic hymns in the Mushua Innu dialect. Akat and her daughter came to the CBC studio earlier this year to record some of those sacred songs. It's a story of family and faith and navigating two worlds at the same time. And Bailey White has more. The Innu have been in Labrador for thousands of years, and they've always had religion. Before there were priests, there were shamans. Manishan Edmonds says it was a shaman on a long hunting trip in neighboring territory who was first introduced to Catholicism. When the shaman returned home, he told his people what he learned. The faith was passed down from generation to generation, alongside the traditional Innu faith which tells of animal spirits who must be respected. Occasionally, a priest would visit the Innu, but the church didn't become a fixture until the 1960s, when the Innu moved off the land and into houses in Davis Inlet. My mom, she dragged us to church. We got dragged to church. If we had a choice, we wouldn't go to church. And we, were, we sat down and we listened. We listened to the singing and the service. And it's always in Innu. My mom didn't go to school. She, uh, she taught herself to read and write in Inu by going to church, you know, by reading the Inu hymns and the Inu service, uh, service books. So, uh, and today she still reads the gospel in church. Yeah, she still, uh, she still goes to church every Sunday. In those early Davis Inlet days, the priest was a powerful man. He brought food and supplies and was often in charge of social assistance programs. But priests typically discouraged the old way of life, traditional medicine, drumming ceremonies, even speaking the language. What's worse, some priests were violent, some sexually abused children. So while Akat found strength in her faith, for others, the church brought nothing but pain. Mom is very influenced by the church because that's what she learned. Our generation started fighting back. No more abuse, you know, no more of this, you know, this negativity that's on our culture, on our parents. So, but they didn't have a choice because they were just coming off the land. Priests no longer hold the power they once did. And Manishan says now she has a healthy relationship with the church. Even though some clergy members did harm her community, she still finds comfort in her faith because it's what her mother taught her. She balances Catholicism with Innu spirituality. There's two worlds, you know, there's our inner world where our spirituality, you know, thrives um, because that's what who we are, you know, that's what who we are. And we can't forget that and we never forget that. And then there's and then there's uh, the other spiritual part of the Catholic Church, you know, that she grew up and and her dad and her grandparents, you know, passed that on to her along with being the Inonis. So there was a combination, there's a combination of that that you can't separate now because they're together, you know, forever. Akat was among the first Mushua Inu to learn these hymns in church, but she will not be the last. These recordings will be shared in Natwashish so that people can listen for years to come. Manishan says women her age do sing in church, but somehow it's not the same. We still go to church, we're still singing, but she's always got to lead. Someone got to lead, you know, those songs. And it's usually my mom that leads those songs. There's no one like her. <laughs> Bailey White, CBC News, St. John's.
Well, back in the 80s, picking out a live tree wasn't terribly popular, and that's because Newfoundland was one of the only two provinces that allowed people to cut down a tree on Crown land without a permit. So we've decided to dip into the archives to bring you this story from The National, which aired in December of 1982. No one grows Christmas trees for sale in Newfoundland. That's because it would be difficult, if not downright impossible, to sell something that's free for the cutting. Barbara Yaffe reports. This is the easy way in Newfoundland. Just pick your tree and pay for it. The trees sell for anywhere from $8 to $40 each. Then there are those who look for a challenge, like Dave Sharp and his kids. What about this one, boys? People here and in Saskatchewan are the only Canadians who can troop into the woods without a permit to cut their own Christmas trees. They can cut as many as they like, as long as it's for their own private use. It's a part of Christmas tradition, and, uh, and uh, I think it would be, uh, in my case anyway, sort of uh, uh, something less of a Christmas without the real smell of a Christmas tree. For many Newfoundland families, the do-it-yourself harvest signals the beginning of Christmas. To build up the Christmas in the stores and that back in October and early November doesn't mean a thing to me until we go in and get our tree. I mean, this is just the start of Christmas to us. It's the way it's always been. Our government would be in a great deal of jeopardy if we were to prevent persons from cutting Christmas trees for their own personal use on any part of Crown land. There are no private tree growers in Newfoundland, just people who harvest trees for sale and they need a permit. But the province says there's no need to bother with a permit system for individual tree cutters. Uh, we have a very small population in relationship to the number of acres of Crown land. And therefore, we have always been able to make sure persons have access to areas where Christmas trees are available. Christmas trees are available just about everywhere here. And for children, decorating a tree cut fresh from the forest is a big part of Christmas in Newfoundland. Barbara Yaffe, CBC News, St. John's. By the way, that has changed. Now the law states you need a domestic cutting permit if you want to go cut down your own Christmas tree. And that permit fee, if you're interested, is $25, $16.25 for seniors. So make sure to get pop to go cut it down. You can save $8.75. Well, welcome back to Here and Now. We're going to return to our top story. Burgio is in mourning tonight after two separate tragic incidents just five days before Christmas. 
One man is dead after an accident at the arena involving the Zamboni. And just after the town received a brand new fire truck, a fire destroyed a house. Justice Minister Andrew Parsons is the MHA for Burgio Lapoil, and we've reached him at his home. Mr. Parsons, truly a horrible 24 hours in Burgio, and I understand that you were there overnight. What were you doing there? Uh, yes, actually, I was in town last night to attend uh, a school awards night, and actually the the unveiling of the, the brand new fire truck that the volunteer fire department got. So true, it was a real celebration yesterday. It was a beautiful day. Everybody was in a great festive mood. And then when you wake up this morning, it's it's devastating. It's tragedy. It's and, and not just one. I mean, one incident in a town like Burgio is, is huge. And then when you have two, it's just it's, it's really hard to comprehend. Well, obviously, we, we can't name names. But what do we know about uh, one of the incidents, particularly the fatal one, the, the Zamboni accident? What do we know? I don't know a whole lot myself. Uh, I was an individual well known in the community, uh, worked at the rink. And I, I don't know the details, so I don't want to speculate. I've seen some pictures uh, of, you know, the, the aftermath, but I, it's, it's horrific. I, I mean, you're so close. I mean, no time of year is a good time. And then when it's just before Christmas, uh, I, I think it's got to be even harder on the family. It's, I can't imagine what they're feeling. Now, you were there for, for what is a good news announcement in a small community in Newfoundland, Labrador, a brand new $350,000 fire truck. I understand there was a minister there blessing the truck saying let's hope we don't have to use it too much and then you woke up this morning and there there, there was still smoke yeah i mean it's it's, it's flabbergasted i mean you, we had a beautiful day new truck the first one in decades and uh when you wake up this morning you see the smoke and you see the trucks and uh and pe some some people have lost a home and when you talk with such a small community with connections in fact the deputy chief of the department, it was his childhood home. So I can only imagine the emotion going through him as he was battling this blaze. It was absolute devastation, as you could see. And I don't think there's anything that could be gathered from it. Uh, but if there's a silver lining, is that thankfully there's no one hurt. And uh, that's the only positive I can take out of it, besides uh, being lucky enough to have such a great fire department to react so quickly. As you well know, Burgio is very hard to get to, but it's an absolutely beautiful, stunning, gorgeous community. Uh, very tight knit. How do you think people in Burgio are going to process and deal with these two awful incidents so so close to Christmas? Well, you know, again, I, I imagine today is pretty much a shock to everybody. But you know, if if there's anything, they will come together. They always do. Uh, they come together in times of good, and then and in times of, like this, they will gather around the families and loved ones, and they will help them. Uh, the, the fire department down there, amazing. And you know what? We're lucky to have them. And again, they will get their support and their help. Uh, but that's all we can do is just, uh, just, again, just reach out to those that are affected. And uh, I can tell you, it's just it's pretty shocking to go from one extreme to the other, to have such a positive day. Uh, it's, just, it's still hard to deal with today. Right. Uh, Andrew Parsons, uh, obviously a horrible story. I appreciate you making time and uh, letting us talk to you at your home. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Well, in Canadian political news, Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil has made a decision that will stop a major mill from dumping waste into the Northumberland Strait. Now, that waste from the northern pulp was supposed to go, was going rather, into waters that's used for fishing by nearby First Nations. Today's decision means the mill is effectively shutting down. And McNeil says that the mill owners had plenty of time to come up with some kind of alternative. Look at the history. The company's had five years and a number of opportunities to get out of Boat Harbor. And at this point, we are not even close to doing that. The company has put us all in a very difficult position. Now for many, the issue boiled down to a choice between jobs and the economy and the environment. Owners of Northern Pulp say the facility's closure is going to mean the loss of 300 jobs at the mill and an estimated 2,400 more jobs in the forestry sector. McNeil announced a $50 million fund to help the affected workers in Nova Scotia.
Welcome back. Some more Christmas weather magic to come. <laughs> we're going to look forward to the end of the weekend. Yes, we are. Uh, we're going to talk about Sunday, which is actually pretty quiet for most of us. Let's, okay. let's take a look at uh, what the future tracker is showing. We talked about that ridge of high pressure a little bit earlier. That's going to start to dominate parts of the island as well. So things should actually clear out as we head through the day. However, uh, along the northeast coast, we are looking still at that chance of uh, some flurries and then along the west coast as well. But as that ridge moves further east, we will start to see some clearing. So certainly good news for Sunday and then late day. The next system will roll in or at least bring some snow uh, for parts of Lab West. So here's a look at your temperatures. Pretty nice, but they are going to drop. So we're going to be sitting in the minus single digits for most of us. Minus six for St. John's again, that potential for flurries, but in the morning and then same thing along the West Coast. Minus five for Corner Brook. Temperatures up through Labrador, though, you're going to sit uh, back down into the minus teens. Minus 13 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 12 for Lab City for Sunday. So overall, not a bad weekend as we head into the beginning of next week. Uh, we're watching another system move through for Monday going to bring potentially some snow for parts of the island into Tuesday watching a system as well. This is uh, Christmas Eve right now. Models are pointing at the fact that we could see a snowstorm or at least some snow uh, Christmas Eve. Exactly where this sets up is a little bit up in the air, so we'll certainly be watching that over the next couple of days. And then as we head into Christmas Day, we are looking at some snow up through Labrador and then along the West Coast as well and then that will continue it looks like into Thursday as a low sits offshore. So here's a look at the next five days as far as temperatures go. Tuesday again that's Christmas Eve a little bit up in the air temperatures probably going to climb up above zero which means some rain could be in the mix. But again, that's completely dependent on the track of that next system. So certainly going to keep the eye on that forecast and then into Wednesday temperatures will dip back down. That's Christmas Day and it does look like some flurry activity will happen. Now for central Newfoundland sunshine on Sunday and then into Tuesday hovering around the zero degree mark. So certainly snow for parts of central. Same thing for western Newfoundland as those temperatures hover uh, near or just below zero through the day and then for Wednesday dipping back below zero. So minus three will be the afternoon high for Christmas Day. It's not too bad as far as those temperatures go. For Eastern Labrador, ridge of high pressure holding strong right through Monday and then that next system will bring in some mild, relatively milder air for both Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we're looking at a similar Forecast for Western Labrador as far as the snow arriving on Monday, but temperatures will dip back down into the minus 20s just in time for Christmas. Anthony. OK, thanks, Rudolph. It was a holiday video only meant for their friends and family, but now it's actually become a huge sensation. A Toronto mother and her two kids shot a remake of the classic Beastie Boys intergalactic music video and it is getting rave reviews. So you wonder what does a hit look like? Well, take a look. We were looking for a three person theme and I thought like what better iconic trio than Beastie Boys. And we do a postcard, like a themed postcard every year. We sent it out to family and friends and we thought we'd make this video just as a little piece of bonus content. I love that music video since I was a kid and I just something about that music video like always stood out to me as like a really amazing way uh, to just have so much creativity and then to kind of be able to do that with my kids this year was super fun. So I just up uploaded it to Facebook for just like my immediate family and friends to see. Someone who saw it like and I also work with said, oh you should put that on somewhere public. We did the whole thing really fast. Production with kids, you have to move extremely quick. So we basically started at that bridge um, at City Place, at Spadina in front, and just walked a little bit on Front Street, went down to the path, um, and then went to Union Station, hopped on the TTC, up to Young and Dundas, and then did the final shot in Young and Dundas Square. It wasn't as big of a production as people would have thought. My favorite part was I was in this rainbow room and the camera was going in a circle around us. We were making really cool poses and it was really, really fun. And I like it when people ask for their lumayato bath. <laughs> <laughs> mm, 
drop. Everyone's kind of like just been so positive. The ultimate goal is to just be able to make something that makes people feel good and especially at this time of year and then for also it to be something that's like shared with the kids. I'm actually so surprised and just flattered by the like overwhelmingly positive outpouring and a really amazing like collective feeling of just good vibes. Isn't this shot just stunning? Oh wow, what a great one. I know, it's so beautiful. I had to share it with you all. I'm sure you know where this is. <laughs> Have an inkling. Yeah, I'll tell you where this is too, if you don't know where this is when we come back. Let's see who's celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. Happy birthday to Ron Buckley, who's celebrating his 95th birthday on Christmas Eve. Hope you get gifts for both occasions. Wishing Martin and Shirley Cooper in Lewisport a very happy 55th wedding anniversary. Laura Butler, originally from Foxtrap, she celebrated her 90th birthday yesterday. And a happy 51st wedding anniversary last Saturday to Lynn and Ella Penny in Somerville. And today, Mary Collins in St. John's is celebrating her 90th birthday. Congratulations. Happy 94th birthday tomorrow to Doris Bull in Eastport and a happy 95th birthday to Helen Phillips in Paradise. She ce will celebrate or she celebrated rather on Wednesday. On Monday, it was a happy 90th birthday for Nellie Russell from Happy Valley Goose Bay and a happy 95th birthday to Ruby McCarthy in Cornerbrook. This Monday, the 23rd, John Tedford from Lawrenceton will celebrate his 95th birthday. And happy 91st birthday last Sunday to David Severs in St. John's and a happy 60th anniversary to Ethel and Wendell Reed in Western Bay. 
Happy 59th anniversary this past Monday to Barbara and Calvin Tilly in St. John's. And a happy 70th wedding anniversary greetings today to Sam and Barbara White in Gander. Happy 64th wedding anniversary greetings to Frank and Margaret Sacre, formerly from Bay Vert, now living in Springdale. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Rollin and Doris Daly of Stephenville. And happy 65th anniversary this Sunday to Will and Melvie Balsam. And today are Ray and Betty Walsh's 50th anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 60th anniversary to Marjorie and Harold Nash in Fortune. And happy 53rd anniversary to Art and Jane Pickett in Lewisport. Joan and Edgar Osmond of Port of Bass celebrated 64 years together on December 19th. And on the 18th, it was a happy birthday for all of Millie in Springdale, who celebrated her 99th birthday. And a happy 98th birthday to Sam White in Gander. His celebration was on the 17th. And Jim Land turns 90 years old on Monday. Best wishes from his seven kids, 14 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. Happy 95th birthday to Mary Doyle in St. John's. And happy 90th birthday to Robert Clark in Harbour Le Coup. Wishing Isabel Hayward, a Scottish war bride, a happy 95th birthday on the 18th. And 50th anniversary wishes to Cyril and Violet Coles, formerly from Milton and Bloomingfield, now residing in Brantford, Ontario. Happy 56th anniversary to Wilbur and Loretta Patey. And happy 50th anniversary to Edward and Sadie Park in Fredericton. Congratulations to Glennis and George Sturge, who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. Also yesterday, happy 66th anniversary to Elmore and Ruby Stokes from Deadman's Bay. Happy 50th anniversary greetings to Horace and Norma Hookey in Port Rexton. Cyril and Elvie Campbell from Raleigh will celebrate 60 years together this Sunday. Also on Sunday, Hayward and Nina Avery in Southport will celebrate a wonderful 60th wedding anniversary. And happy 96th birthday to Annie Button, formerly of Lead Cove. Looking good, everybody? Mm -hmm. Now, back to Christmas. A great <laughs> sweater, by the way. I, I don't know how I can top that. Uh, now, do you know that classic holiday song, Christmas Island? I do oh, not, you know? actually. You probably actually do. Oh, okay. You've heard it in your, at least your childhood. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm tempted to sing it, but I'll spare the audience. It's sort of, you know, it's how would you like to spend on Christmas Island? You don't never ring a bell. I'm sorry. It doesn't ring any of those bells. <laughs> it doesn't ring any of these bells, yeah. yeah. A lot of people would like to spend time on Christmas Island. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe not after seeing this. <laughs> a yeah. man has modified his Jeep to deal with an annual problem, which is roads of overrun ah. by millions of red crabs. There they are. And the man, he owns an eco lodge. Look at all those crabs. Yeah, oh, that's he, actually really cool. Yeah, he installed deflectors that sweep crabs out of the way without harming any of them. Christmas Island closes many roads every December because it's the crabs spawning season. Boy, they must spawn in a rush. They've also built uh, <laughs> underpasses and bridges for these migrating crabs to use. The island and Australian territory is home to about 1,500 people, but 40 million crabs. All of them that you just saw in here now. Isn't nature amazing? It is. Oh, all of those things are so cool. Are we out of time for the picture? No, I, I hope not. I, I hear, hear it too, but uh, no, obviously we know where this is. Uh, it is uh, through looking towards Narrows. I know I was on the Avalon yesterday, but I had to share this beautiful sunning sky with you. Douglas uh, sent us that wonderful photo, and if you have any you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. All right, close the show on a little towny bias. Hey, why not? Great shot. <laughs> have a great weekend. Be careful. I know lots of parties this weekend. Yeah, Don't drink safe. and drive. Be safe. We'll see you on Monday. Good night.